In many cases, the first set of symbols introduced to children with severe disabilities are PCS symbols. And where the children struggle, the program just goes on and on and on. These are children that may be progressing much more rapidly if a different set of pictures were used or a different style of representation was used, for example, photographs. When we over rely on one symbol set, we may limit the vocabulary available. For example, some students are held back on being introduced to additional symbols beyond a set of eight until those eight symbols are mastered. If there's something intrinsically difficult about the symbols themselves, individuals that have the potential to using larger sets of vocabulary are not provided the opportunity to do so. Where there is an over-reliance on a particular symbol set, we may see a flat trajectory in terms of the size of the vocabulary and the number of symbols over time. In other words, a child may be stuck with four symbols, and this may continue over a period of months and sometimes over a period of years as the speech language pathologist looks for evidence of mastery of that initial set of four symbols. Is there a simple but comprehensive tool we can use to foster an integrated model of service delivery? One thing I've found to be especially effective in this regard is the use of a matrix. I've talked about this on a couple of occasions, as has Cushing and colleagues, as well as others. In using a matrix model, the special ed and general education teachers and other staff collaborate to determine curriculum content and modifications, materials they will be using, etc. The speech path collaborates with the teacher aid and others to identify communication goals to be targeted at different times of the day. The same would hold true for the physical therapist, occupational therapist, and others. What we're looking at is a means by which we can systematically identify objectives and identify systematically means by which those objectives can be targeted in an integrated manner throughout the day across multiple situations, again, with multiple people. Here's an example of a matrix. As you can see, along the top, we've got different settings in which interactions are occurring or how the school day is playing out. After arriving in the morning and participating in morning meeting, the child moves to physical education, then art, music, lunch, school job, a second period of art, social studies, and then leaves for the day. We also look at the IEP goals. These might include requesting objects and actions, introducing topics and interactions with peers, and commenting on an action or event observed. Once again, these are communication objectives we could also incorporate motor objectives or others that we want to again target in an integrated manner. What we see in the literature is a growing body of evidence to reinforce the notion that providing an AAC system does not negatively impact the development of speech. It doesn't communicate to individuals that there's no need for them to speak or there's a need to give up on speech or not to work on speech. To the contrary, it's often been reported that speech improves and individuals are more motivated to speak when they have a backup system available to them, such as an AAC device or a gestural method of communication. That said, I'm alarmed by the fact that very, very few of the individuals that I now see in my private practice have goals related to speech on their IEPs. Speed is often a factor. How long does it take to convey a message? I remember when I first got into the field of AAC, I worked with a young woman named Ruth. Ruth was using a new prototype AAC device. It was called the TIC, the Tufts Interactive Communicator. Again, we're going way, way back to the 1970s here, old school. And in this case, the TIC was a device where the device would scan from row to row on a series of letters. When a row containing a letter Ruth wanted to convey was illuminated, she would activate a switch with her head. She would then activate the switch a second time 
on the column in which the letter appeared, and that letter would be posted up on the display. It would then go back to the top and again start to scan rows and columns. It took Ruth approximately 15 seconds on average for each letter. Thus, any given message might involve several minutes of her time. At the time, it was not seen as that alarming to find staff who would ask Ruth a question and then leave the room. They would come back five minutes or 10 minutes later to read Ruth's response. Well, we've come a very long way from here, but speed continues to be a factor in determining whether or not individuals will communicate with an individual with severe disabilities. For example, I've seen situations where students have access to high-tech AC devices and are capable of using them within a classroom setting. The teacher, however, has determined from experience that if she calls upon this particular student in a given situation, it may take a minute or two for the student to formulate their response. The teacher's strategy then is to ignore the student. They purposely orient their body and their gaze in such a way that they don't have to see the student bidding to participate and ask a question or formulate a response to a question. This is not a situation in which we need to chastise the teacher, but instead to appreciate the fact that speed is impeding that student's ability to participate in that particular classroom routine. As such, we supplement the AAC device with other methods of communication that will enable that student to participate in that school curriculum in a more effective and efficient manner.